why do you find video games so captivating? Yeah, for me, video games are such a unique art form that mixes the emotional with the physical. I sit and I watch a movie, I sit and I listen to music. In video games, I interact with a story, with characters, with sound that a very creative team have, has built and my physical input into that experience just makes it so much more visceral and kind of lands at a, a very core level for me. I've just arrived in Melbourne and I'm off to meet the head of Xbox, Phil Spencer. Phil is in the country to meet some of our local gaming industry development folk to see what they're working on and also to impart his knowledge on them. We're now on our way to the arcade where I'm going to meet a lot of indie devs, see what they're working on and see a lot of Phil Spencer. Now hopefully not too much, although that would be one way to make sure this video goes viral. Hello. How are you, Nick? Phil. Nice to meet you. These are cameras. Yes, they are. Yeah. <laughs> they have names, though. Yeah. No, we don't. We don't refer to them by their <laughs> names. We've lost Phil. I have no idea where he is. This was your fault. Phil, what was your impression of the arcade? Spending the time to put the space together and uh, kind of the facilitation of that, I think it's just a great service to the game industry, mm -hmm. uh, which is fantastic. And then just seeing the energy of the studios together. And you could see even when we would walk from demo station or from studio to studio, that you'd kind of get the people from the last demo coming with you. Yeah. And the feeling of, of people rooting for one another is such a, a cool thing. Do you think that spaces like this provide great content? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple, uh, not exactly the same, but a, a couple of similar things that happen in the States. Just the sense of people helping each other and, hey, I, I solved this problem, here's how I did it, uh, I, I think is great. I get asked a lot, hey, how do I get into the game business? What should I go do? And I would say, just go create something. Because when you go create something, uh, the process of putting something out, getting feedback, getting slammed for certain things, getting applauded for other things, I think is a really critical step in somebody's career in, in working on video games. That doesn't always happen when you end up in a big team and it's mm. really hard to take what I did and the direct uh, response from the, the, the players. Here, there's nothing to hide behind. And uh, so I think getting people together and then having students that can actually move up and, and create small studios and even people who have been at bigger places and want to start their own thing, giving them a space to build their own stuff and, and feel like uh, some of the facilitation goes away and they can just focus on what they want to go do is, is fantastic. The next stop for Phil was just up the road at the Australian Centre for the Moving Image. Here he spoke on a panel sharing his knowledge with Australia's young game designers. I'd soon get a chance to chat with him one-on-one, -on -one, but not until after lunch. Get out of my face. What was it about Australia that brought you down here? Yeah, that's a good question. I've never been here before. Uh, Just the been... beaches then. <laughs> I haven't been to the beach. Well, I was at Bondi Beach. Yeah. What do we think of Bondi Beach? Bondi Beach is hands down the best beach in Australia. And I don't care what any of you Melbourne <laughs> people say. They all suck down here. <laughs> Bondi's the best. <laughs> I don't want to get in the middle of any kind of territorial uh, things going on. We had a good time with the fans. Uh, the real, the so. Pragmatically, the thing that brought me down was that EB Games Expo is going on, and we had the opportunity to talk to uh, the community here, the store managers. The ability to sit down and talk to people that either use Xbox, play games, get direct feedback face-to-face -face from somebody that's either frustrated or sees opportunity or just has questions. In this job, it is just so valuable in trying to think about the future of where we should go. I noticed today you did spend a lot of time, every time you met a developer, you were also asking them, what can we do for you guys? You know, what can, as we as a company can help you. What sort of takeaways do you take from that? Like, what have you put into the Xbox platform that you've learned from, from devs over the last couple of years? It sounds kind of capitalist pig-like, but having a platform where developers can build games that make money mm. is the kind of engine that keeps the industry moving. 
And as a platform holder, I know that my job is to build that canvas that either the existing big AAA teams or we've spent a lot of times with smaller teams today, when they see opportunity or they see things that's hold, that are holding their creative or their business aspirations back, uh, I know that actually hurts the overall business and my platform. Some of the best ideas we've had have come from studios just saying, we would like to go do X. I mean, maybe, and mods aren't something new in gaming, but they are on console. When Todd Howard at Bethesda, not an indie, but came in and said, hey, we really want to take this great mod community that we have on PC around Fallout and, and bring it to console. We started working with them probably almost a year ago now to try to make that happen. And I think it makes the experience better. Uh, and it also opens up unique business opportunity for the studios. So you were there. I mean, I asked them that because it actually is totally self-serving yeah. uh, to us as a platform. And frankly, when I see something that's unique that a studio is trying to do, I know they've run into issues that we're creating. And they all gave me feedback. It takes too long to cert things. I need to turn around more quickly. And I might see things from other games that I will throw in my ideas. Yeah. Not because I'm smart. I just see a lot of stuff. Uh, and I, I push that out. And I, I think that that direct feedback with creators is, uh, is critical to our platform. Do you find that since you transitioned from first party development, uh, sort of overseeing that to just the head of everything, that you've actually in some the ways, head the, he the head of everything, <laughs> it, it should be on your business card. <laughs> Do you find that you're actually getting more sort of hands-on with people all over the place? Like it, there's more interacting, it's almost like a mentor role as opposed to just sort of corporate? Or are you still just straight corporate head of everything, <laughs> TM? Well, I do think, for better or for worse, I come at the job of head of Xbox as somebody who has spent the last decade plus building games. So when I, I, I you know, I, I don't have uh, an MBA, I, I, don't, I don't come at it from a marketing perspective, I come at it at this role as somebody who's built my career creating things. So when I get out and I talk to gamers, I play games all the time. So you know, I love, hey, what, what, how are you feeling about this? What's your reaction to that? Talking to studios, I've been in their shoes. I know what it means and what it feels like to be a month away from trying to ship. I get the added capability now to actually look at, say, the console itself. And we just shipped the Xbox One S. Mm. We're gonna ship Scorpio next year. And looking at those and saying, okay, as a creator, what do I want to see in the console that we build, in the live service? What features do I think I need as a creator? I don't know if that makes it right, but they put the guy who was head of first party into this role, and what they're gonna get is somebody who kind of looks at the problem space through the eyes of somebody who builds and plays a lot of games. We're gonna try to rebuild gamer trust and brand trust. And there's really only one way I know to do that, which is let's go build a platform that plays great games that gamers want to play. In this, uh, I think in the last generation with the 360, it was kind of it was kind of accepted that Xbox was on top in that generation. There was just in the mind share of, of gamers, it was kind of that was where the great games were. And then when uh, the one came out, it was a bit of a rocky launch, like you acknowledge today. Uh, how did you get the team motivated to to move past? that and actually focus back down onto what makes the console important? Yeah, the motivation of the team was there in, in such kind of deep wells of passion. It was, n the motivation of the team was never an issue. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, as I was talking about earlier, we were talking about this on, uh, with the, the students, that unlocking the passion of the team and getting them to re-believe in our capability was the only thing I needed to do because the capability was there. They just had to believe that we were doing things for the right reasons, we had the right customer in mind and the right ambition in mind. Once you unlock that, literally, and it's kind of a, a cliche, you know, the team gets so much work done in, in between the times. Like I, they'll, I'll come in for a review and a team will say, okay, we're working on this and I'll give my feedback, they'll give me their feedback. And then a month later, I'll have seen them and the progress they made feels like a year to me. Yeah. I'm like blown away because when it, and game teams do this all the time, when things get rolling, the capability of the team itself actually accelerates and, and accentuates the capability of any of the individuals. And people assume it's a different team because they looked and said, well, it must be a team issue. It was never a team issue. And do you feel like uh, being in an underdog position actually strengthens you? 
that you're, you're hungry to sort of turn around and, and, and make something. I mean, you look at Sony with PS3 to PS4 and they just went, we are only going to focus on being there for the gamer. And that was something that came out of their sort of not, it seemed like they didn't really know what they wanted to do with the PS3. Yeah, I, I know there's, there's, this, there's pockets uh, out there that kind of pit PlayStation against Xbox. You know, I'm, I'm more focused on what we're trying to do in meeting the high demands of the customers that we have. And um, I think we were an underdog in the eyes of our customers, not in the context of, of what PlayStation was doing. You know, the, the biggest downer for me after the launch of the Xbox One was people I had known from 360 generation who'd kind of bleed green at the, at the yeah. core saying, like, why are you guys doing that? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't feel like the team that I know. And that whole sentiment in the last couple of years is the thing I'm kind of most proud of that the team's been able to achieve because now those same people come back and are surprised and delighted by the, the things that are happening that the team is delivering on. Now, I think Sony's done a really nice job with the PlayStation 4 and they've received obviously great market acceptance of their product. But I actually don't see it as a zero-sum game between the work that they do and the work that we do. I think both companies can be successful. Yeah. The best kind of thing that I think came out of that is the listening systems, if you want to call them that, that we have in place now, so that we get direct, immediate feedback through things like the preview program, from user voice on xbox.com, so people can tell us exactly what they want. We're just much more socially and customer focused now. And particularly with the launch of Xbox Play Anywhere, which I think was something that was this really cool announcement that I think could be as big for you guys as pretty much a new console. You're absolutely right. When you start off with an idea like Xbox Play Anywhere and I sit down with the team and say, hey, I think we should actually, we should entitle people to play the games on Xbox or Windows. They just buy the game once and they can play. You know, some of the more business-oriented people say, well, we're giving away a game for free. Yeah. And you kind of pick that apart and say, really? Do we really think we have people that buy our game twice? As a, a service-based game, which almost all of ours are now with the online community that exists afterwards, do we really think it's a great thing to have these kind of separate communities by device that people play on? I'd say the acquisition of Minecraft was pretty enlightening as well, because we know that people play Minecraft across mm. so many devices, and we're trying to, to link those communities together. It's great right now, because I think in the next six months or so, we're coming up on almost 20 XBA games that will probably come out. I mean, the number will go up and down. And those aren't all first party. Like, we're yeah. starting to see, the indies are actually more, the most excited. Yeah, the, totally. The third parties are gonna watch and say, okay, did it help or hurt Forza? Did it help or hurt Gears? And we'll have to be transparent with them about what we think. We don't have a clean A-B test to say, okay, this is what it would have done without or with. Um, but it's really great to see the indies embracing, uh, which will be strong. And our first party, I'm extremely committed to it, because I think it's the right thing for the customer. You also spoke about the idea of uh, upgradable consoles or yeah. iterative, and you've sort of said that that is something that potentially could be where we're headed. With the announcement uh, of the PS4 Pro and this sort of, uh, there's, a, there's a feeling of customer confusion around why you might want that. Do you see Xbox as possibly going not console and just becoming sort of platform agnostic? I think our first party hardware is really important to our, our ambitions in gaming. Whether it's the console, which I'm extremely committed to, it's, why you do something crazy like announce two of them on one stage at E3, <laughs> uh, to things like our Elite Controller. You know, I just think our ability to add hardware, software, and service and content together is a unique capability that I, I want to continue to foster and grow. So on the console side, I mean, I, I know there's certain people that might bet that in the long run, we're all streaming our games mm -hmm. down uh, and playing across any device, and maybe that's there, right? If the customers want that and we get that, then you know, obviously we're gonna follow where customer demand is, but I, I think us, the devices that we build, specifically in this question, the console, uh, is an important part of the, the ecosystem for years and years to come, and it's why we invested in, or announced both of them, and I've said publicly before, we're already looking at what's next. Mm. Like, we're trying to look at the, the trends in technology and consumer, to say, well, okay, what is it that we would do past Scorpio? Because the lead times on these things are, are, are long and, and you want to get it right. Just going back to your role uh, right now, what do, what do you feel like has been the biggest challenge that you've had to overcome? Hmm. Uh, my biggest challenge, 
I should have a good answer for this. I don't. It's, a it's good just question. been smooth sailing. No, no, <laughs> it, it hasn't. It hasn't. Um, I, I, but I'm trying to come up with something that would be insightful for somebody to listen to. I mean, I can, because the fan side of it at first, I just I didn't. As the head of first party, like a Phil Spencer's, uh, whoever that is, yeah. and you've got you know the Dons and the Mark Wittens and other people that were kind of more the visible spokespeople for what we were doing. Um, but I mean, nobody wants to hear me go on about like what it means to be that visible and that, that public. Uh, the, the thing, I guess, from a purely pragmatic standpoint is, is the, the hardware timelines for me, like I, I've just never been a hardware person. Mm. And I know what I want out of the platform I'm building for, but try, but like I can, we can, you and I could sit here and play Halo Wars 2, yeah. which is coming out in, in 2017. We could play it, have some feedback, get in, would get into the game. Like your hardware timelines are so long out that you've got to make these bets. And like the decision, do we announce Scorpio and, and, and uh, Xbox One S on stage at E3 is something that has long-term implications to the business and your hardware roadmap because you're making commitment to the customers about what you're going to go do a year plus in advance. And there's real risk around that. There's real customer confusion that can pop up, like mm. you mentioned. And on the game side, I just, I've been doing that for a while. At the overall platform level, I've learned and I've made mistakes and the mistakes have come back in social and other commentary uh, right in front of me. And I, I just, you know, I, I know that, I, I appreciate that the Xbox community has suffered with me through the, <laughs> <laughs> suffered me through the, this process of learning. Uh, and that's that's an important thing that the timelines and the, the kind of complexity is, is very broad now. I think I'm kind of getting on top of it after a mm. couple of years, but it's it's a big job. What do you hope you achieve before you move on from this role? What do you want your legacy to be? I'm going to start with the team. You know the because you and I talked about it earlier, and, and and it makes me when people ask me the question, I reflect back on it. I, I honestly believe I get to work with one of the most talented and, and passionate teams on the planet. And I want them to feel like they have the capability and my, my job as an enabler for the team uh, is, is something that's incredibly important. So when I'm no longer doing this job and they think about what we were able to accomplish as Team Xbox during this time, I want them to feel like they could work at their maximum potential and management was an enabler of what they want, wanted and, and needed to go do and not somebody who kind of curtailed um, or, or kind of or inhibited their ability to be successful. On the outside, when I think about gaming all up, uh, this is probably too big of an ego answer, but when I think about things like cross-play and play anywhere, and this is not competitive against any other platform, mm -hmm. this is really just me thinking these kind of constructs I do believe are good for gamers yeah. and the industry. And I'm hoping that as we take our Xbox platform and push on those things, that some of these things stick and just the idea that I buy my games per device or I can only play with people that happen to be on the same device on the same network I'm on kind of goes away. I just think that's a better spot for developers. It's a better spot for gamers. I love that as the head of the company that's one of the big pillars of gaming, you're actually more interested in tearing down the walls that keep you guys separated than you are building them up. Yeah, this, not to make it about Microsoft, I know we're, we're getting close here, it is one of the enablers of working at a company like Microsoft. You know, Microsoft in their ambitions to empower people to do more, it's, it's about the person more than it is a specific device, more than it is about a specific kind of closed ecosystem. I think there's some really special things about a console and, and I'm going to hold on to those things, hold dear to them in terms of how your games work and parental controls and great on my TV in a family room environment. But focusing on the person and what we empower that person to go do, I think is at a fundamental level the right thing to do. And I work at a company that that's their ambition. How do we use gaming, game consoles, and gaming on other devices as something that just reaches as, as many people as possible? Phil, thank you very much for your thank time. Thank you. Cheers. It's been good. Thank you very much, guys. Beautiful. Thank you.